book of Acts chapter 4, as we continue our study here in the book of Acts. Today we'll be looking at verse 13, down to verse 31, and today we want to look at how we are to obey God rather than man. We want to look at and uh, see what God has told us about obeying the powers that be or governmental authority and how and when we are to disobey or disregard the laws of the land. Let's read from verse 13, Acts chapter 4. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle have been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no farther among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in his name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had father threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For well, the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shown. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lift up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, when the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, or to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray, Lord, as I attempt to expound upon these words today, I pray for unction, and I pray for anointing, Lord, that I'll be able to preach, and it will be through your power, not mine. I pray now that we will see clearly what you have for us to see from these verses. And Lord, we will allow you to enlighten us today that we may be stronger and that we may be bolder and that we may be wiser in all thy will. And Lord, I pray now that we will allow you to just take charge of our lives and use us as would be according to your will. I pray as always that you hide me behind the cross. Help me to decrease <coughs> and increase in the message. Help me not in any way to block the view of the cross today. But may I magnify you and may we see Jesus in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. I <coughs> want us to look at 
the context and then some other verses and some other places in the scripture that will shed some light on what we're talking about today. This episode that happened here takes two chapters. It continues there from chapter 3 and now is the, the story is continuing as to what was happening when Peter and John had went up to the temple to pray and there on their way in the temple had healed this lame man who was lame from birth. It was a birth defect. This man being above 40 years of age certainly revealed that this was not some kind of a, a magic act or something that would uh, just be to deceive people. This was an actual <coughs> miracle because all of the people around knew him. He had been coming there to the temple for years and they knew that he was lame from birth. Now, because of that, <coughs> and because of the attention that has uh, John and Peter has gotten from that and the message that they preached that is what agitated those Jewish leaders and because they were preaching the name of Jesus they have brought them in and set them before <coughs> the Sanhedrin and we saw last week where they had appeared before the Sanhedrin after being kept in jail overnight. The Sanhedrin being a court made up of 71 individuals, including the high priest, and now they have seated them in the midst, and they have uh, went through the, the court, and now at the end of that trial, after Peter has had the opportunity to speak more about Jesus, now they know and they see that Peter and John, although they are ignorant and unlearned as to the law and have never been to the rabbinical schools or have never been uh, higher educated in the doctrines of the law, they know that they have been with Jesus. They can see that. This is one thing that needs to be evident in our life when people see us is that they leave and say, well, I know that person has been with Jesus. And then they also saw the man that was healed. He was standing with them. So they could not refuse or reject the fact that there had been a miracle Form because it was there before them. So now they ask John and Peter to go outside and they're going to decide what they're going to do, what the penalty is going to be. They certainly want to stop this movement that's preaching Jesus any way they can. That's what they want to stop. So now they must decide what are we going to sentence them for? And when they left and went out, they began to uh, go into conference and confer one with another. And they realized that we cannot deny the miracle. It's happened. So we have no real basis or real uh, uh, evidence that we can use against them. The only thing that we can use against them is that they're preaching in the name of Jesus, who we have condemned and crucified already. And then, so they said, well, we will warn them that they do not continue this message and continue speaking in his name. So they went out and they warned them. They said, do not speak anymore or teach anymore in the name of Jesus. And we see the reaction of Peter and John. And they said, well, we must hearken to God, not you. And he asked, they asked them the question of how they should do that. And he said, we can only speak what we know and what we've seen. Now, one of the reasons that the uh, Sanhedrin would not give any stronger punishment is because of the people. Because they're in verse 21, it says, so when they had father threatened them 
They let them go finding nothing how they might punish them. There was no evidence for them to use to issue a stricter punishment. But look at this. Because of the people, for all men glorified God for that which was done. Now the very reason that caused them from going any farther here is because all the people were there and they were observing what had been done and they were kind of on the side of Peter and John. So it was because of publicity they did not issue any stronger punishment. So now Peter and John go back to their people, to the other, other Christians, and when they get back, they relay the message that all that they have went through, and then they offer a prayer to the Lord. And they, in this prayer, they pray some verses from the psalm from David when it said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? They're talking about how the world and how the people of the age act toward Jesus. The heathen rage, that's the word for becoming like a mob against against something. And that's certainly the way that they did Jesus when he uh, came to trial. They came against him as a howling mob. That's the same way that they will come against you and I today. This world hates Christ. It hates Jesus. So he says the heathen are outraged and imagine vain things. Now, that word, of course, for imagine is to plot. And then the word vain is empty or useless. And what he's saying is that all of the things that they plot against God is useless because they cannot overpower God. So ultimately, he will be the one that puts down all. So they are working towards something they can't win. He even talked about those that had stood against Christ who were uh, uh, the kings of the earth, the rulers of the earth that had gathered against Christ. But one thing that's very important here when they're offering this prayer, and that is that they recognize the sovereignty of God and that God has predetermined everything that has happened. Because look on down in verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. And look at verse 28. This is where it clarifies. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. And the word counsel there could be translated purpose. So he's saying they were only doing what God has already predetermined to be done. They were acting according to the purpose of God when they came against Jesus. This was what he had already predetermined in the time past. So they recognized that although these things look bad and looks like maybe that they are in control or acting uh, in, a, in a way that they would be in control. They're only acting according to what God has already purposed. And we can look at the world today and see the same thing. We see although the world is raging, the heathen are raging. They're only acting according to God's purpose. And he will use that and bring that to fulfill his ultimate purpose. We can look today and see how the heathen rage. All you have to do is look at the Muslim nation. We have saw that just this week. How they hate Jesus. How they hate anybody that would stand for Christ and stand for true salvation through Jesus Christ. How they act toward Christians. How that if you were to try 
in one of these nations to set up a church openly, they would come against you and kill you immediately because you're not even allowed to be a Christian in one of those nations. Why do the heathen rage? Why do they have such a, an attitude of hate toward this one man, Jesus, because it's through his name and only his name that salvation can be had. That's why. Because Satan is always trying to destroy this man and this name and this movement that is the true movement of bringing men to God where they can be saved. So we see that today. We see it everywhere. Now, when we're in a nation or we're under the laws of a nation, how do we react to that when we are facing persecution or we're facing something that will tell us to stop what we're doing in the name of Christ? One thing we need to always remember, we are to respect the authority of a government, regardless of what kind of government that is. When Peter and John were arrested, and they went through the courts, they acted with respect to that court, and they never did rebel against it or act disrespectful to those that were trying to persecute them. Now this is something that we need to observe. Watch people when they are being, uh, uh, when, when, when the world is coming against them and they claim that it's because of their faith or because they're trying to promote the gospel, watch how they act toward that. Are they respectful toward those in authority? Or are they disrespectful? Peter and John never came out of their bad mouth in the Sanhedrin. They didn't come out uh, talking, uh, giving some kind of bad uh, statements toward those that had helped them or those that had charged them. No. They realized that God is in ultimate control and whatever He allows for them to go through, there is a purpose in it just like the purpose that Christ came and died for our sins that was serving God's purpose. So what are we to do? How are we to view the government. There's a couple of places in the scriptures we want to turn. Let's turn first over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and let's look at verse 13 through 17. Here, Peter gives us some clear directions as to how we are to view the powers of government. Now remember, Peter is one of those that have been taken here in charge. And Peter, of course, Later, will even be put to death for his faith. And although he knows and understands that, here is what he says when we are dealing with government authority. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man, every institution of man, for the Lord's sake. You're doing it for Christ's sake. Whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now that's what he says about how we're to react to government authority. We are to submit to it because it's of God. We are to recognize that the king is in supreme authority if it is a government where there is a king and those governors and those under him are there for the purpose of punishing evil doers. 
And he's saying that we are to act, although we are free in Christ, we are not to use our liberty in an evil way, is what he's saying. And this is something that many times you see. You see people that will use their Christianity in an evil way because they will go against government authority and abuse government authority in a way that's certainly not pleasing to God. So when Peter gives us these warnings, he lets us know that government is of God. Now let's turn over to Romans chapter 13 because now Paul is going to give us some more insight on the government and how we are to view that. Now let me insert this right here. God put up three institutions, or he instituted three things. The first one was the institution of marriage and the family. He did that all the way back in Genesis, the early part of Genesis, when he brought man and wife together and placed them in a, in a place where they could replenish the earth and there would be a family unit as the husband being the head of the family. And they were to operate in a governmental type uh, a place there because a family structure has to have someone in, in charge and operate like that. That's the first institution. That's why it's the most important institution that God had established because according to family, how family goes is the way other things go. The second institution he set up is in uh, Genesis 9, and that is human government. After the flood, he established human government, and we read there from the scriptures that the first thing that he instituted when he established human government was the death penalty for murder, for premeditated murder. That was one of the first <laughs> things that he dealt with. And for first degree premeditated murder, the death penalty was always to be enacted. And it was never rescinded. And although under the law of Israel, they had the death penalty for some other things as well, the death penalty for murder was the one that had always been even from early in Genesis. Now he's saying if a man takes man's life by man shall his blood be shed. That means through the government, through man's authority, where man will govern himself, he will be put to death for his act of murder. So, and then there's a third institution, and that is the church. And that happened in Acts chapter 2, but God now has established a church. The church is made up of all believers. Of all people, every person on earth, whether they be Jew, Gentile, can come in and be a part of the church if they come through Jesus Christ. The church, of course, the head of the church is Christ. We operate under His authority here in this world, under governmental authority also, but He is ultimate authority, so we never put government ahead of Christ, we that are in the church. Now these three institutions must operate within the boundaries that God has established them and never outside of that. So now in Romans chapter 13, he's going to tell us more about how we are to act toward government authority. In verse 1 of chapter 13, that every soul be subject unto the higher powers, the higher powers, or the governing, uh, governing authorities. That's what that means. For there is no power, there is no authority, but of God. The powers or the, the authorities that be are ordained of God. Now he's saying that every government is ordained. He, he, he's the one that ordained government, human government. So when we fail to obey human government, we're failing to obey God because he ordained human government. 
government that we were to live under the laws of human government. Now look at verse 2. He said, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resisteth shall receive to themselves damnation or judgment. He's saying that you are always to obey the law because in obeying the law, you are obeying God. If you do not obey the law, you are bringing judgment on yourself. He said, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Understand that. The, the authority given to government is God's authority to execute judgment and to hold accountable those that would be lawbreakers or do evil. He said, Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For conscience sake. He's saying, do not just obey the law to keep from being penalized or judged by the law. You do it because it's right when you obey the law. You are doing what is right. It needs to be your conscience that keeps you in obedience to the law. Verse 6, for, for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues tribute to whom tribute is due, Custom to her custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So he's saying you must always obey the law, you must always pay your taxes, and you must always honor those in the place of authority, in government authority. <coughs> now this is the teaching of God through the apostles. He didn't tell us if it's this kind of government then you obey it. No, he's talking about any kind of government. He doesn't specify any specific government. He talks about king because most of the governments back in the older days were kings. They were that type of government. Of course, in Paul's day, when he's writing, and Peter's day, they were under the Roman government of the emperor. And the Roman government was a very harsh government, the Iron Hill of Rome, very oppressive government. But yet, being under that government, that form of government, they are told to be obedient all the time to those that are in authority. That's why when you see Paul, and he's arrested, and most of his ministry is spent in jail, he is always respectful of those that are in authority. He is never disrespectful to those that have captive, have him held captive or to those that he goes before. When he appears before those that are in power like Felix and Festus and those, he is very, very respectful to them and he shares the gospel. He gives them his testimony. He shares the gospel because he has taken that opportunity trying to reach them with the gospel. And then he makes his appeal. He makes his appeal. He uses the system, the court system, to appeal his case all the way to Caesar because that's the proper method of using the authorities or the powers that be. So we're always to be obedient to the law unless, unless the law is asking us to disobey God or to stop preaching the message of the gospel. Now, where do we have in the scriptures that we can disobey the law? Look over in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. Exodus 
chapter 1. Remember, in Exodus chapter 1, you had the king. They were trying to stop. This was a time when Satan was trying to stop uh, the Christians, of course, from uh, and all down through history, Satan was trying to stop the Messiah from being born. In Exodus chapter 1, look at verse 15. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shephara, and the name of the other Pew. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him, but if it be a daughter, then he shall leave. Look at verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. Here is a time when we can see a biblical precedent of disobeying the king or the laws of the land. And that's in the case of trying to destroy some person or take the life of some person or in, in some way harm some individual. And it's time then to disobey the law of the land. We can certainly see that today. We could use abortion as one of those things that although it's legal, it's certainly not right. And we know that abortion is always murder, not just in some cases, in every case. Yes. Because when you take a life, you stop a life, <laughs> then you have murder. Yes. And although we might, uh, if, if we are really pro-life, as uh, if, if you want to use that terminology, if we are really pro-life, that means that we believe abortion is murder in every case, in yes. every case. Yes. Because if that is a life, and we know not only from uh, the Word of God, we know from science that life begins at conception. And when life begins to stop that life at any time is to commit murder. That's yes. what the Bible would say about it, and that's what we know it is. So it, it doesn't, there, there's no exceptions. There's no exceptions. If it is life, then it's murder every time. If it's not life, then it's never murder, so it wouldn't matter. It would never be wrong. So there's no such thing as having some kind of compromising, sympathetic view of abortion being right in some cases and wrong in others. No, it's either murder or it's not. And if it is murder, which we know it is, then it's always wrong. If it's not murder, then it's never wrong. It would be all right in any situation. So that's one of the instances that we would disobey the laws of the land. There's another place in Daniel chapter 6. We can get an illustration of when the law was disobeyed. Daniel chapter 6. Let's uh, look at verse number 4. Verse number 4. When the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom and governors and the princes and counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days Save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law 
of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Therefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now, here's a decree that all of those of the land, all of the, those that were on the president's council and or the king's council and all of those had gotten together because they wanted to stop Daniel. They hated him. So they had taught the king and appealed to his ego and got him to sign a decree which was binding and irrevocable. It was according to the laws of Medes and Persians. It could not be changed. And when he did that, they knew they had Daniel then because the decree said if anyone calls upon any god other than you. And they put the king in the place of God, in the supreme place. Then he shall be cast into the lion's den. Now they thought they had Daniel. So look at verse 10. And it said, look how Daniel reacted to this law. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open. In his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a four time. <laughs> no change of what he did. Not one thing did it change about Daniel. Just as he had prayed three times a day before, after the law, he looked at the law and he just laid it aside and continued doing just as he always had. Amen. You see, here is what we as believers do. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what laws they put out. We continue to preach the gospel and be faithful to God regardless of what the penalty is that the law declares. We never, ever, ever give in to government authority where it would cause us not to be faithful to God. So there is what happened. Now, did, did Daniel face the penalty? Yes, he did. He faced it. They took him. They cast him in the den of lions. But God intervened. And in the den of lions, God locked the jaws of the lions. And he was protected in the den. Hallelujah. Now, King Darius, of course, he saw what had happened. After that, he saw he had been tricked. He saw that they had just used him to get at Daniel. And Darius knew that Daniel's God would take care of him. He knew that. But all that night, Daniel slept. King Darius was awake. He couldn't sleep. He was miserable because he knew the decree couldn't be broken. The law of the Medes and Persians said it cannot be altered. And he had to go through with what he had signed. But he knew. And early the next morning, King Darius comes out and he runs down to the lion's den and he yells in and says, Oh, Daniel, thy God, whom thy servant continually has he delivered you. And he said, Oh, King, live forever. My God has shut the lion's jaws and there has no harm come to me in that because faithfulness to God is always right regardless of what this government or this world says it's always right and we will always win in the end God's people have a layer of protection yes. that this world knows nothing about we can ever we can ever lose by standing for God we can never lose because we are faithful to him so we are to respect the government. We are to obey the government. We're always to obey the law and be very respectful to those in the place of authority until the law interferes with our obedience to God and our following Him. And then we're to disregard the laws of the land and allow the punishment that the law says that we that we deserve, we're to submit to that. Now, here, when the when Peter and John now have finished telling those that they 
have come back from the Sanhedrin and now they're telling those of what happened and they are giving praise to the Lord. Look back in Acts 4 and verse 29. And now, Lord, this is their last request they've asked God for. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. He's saying, you know their threatenings, Lord. You know what they've said. Now grant unto thy servant that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Lord, you know what they've told us. But, Lord, here's what we're asking you. Give us the strength and the boldness. To keep being faithful to you. Because that's what we're going to do. Now look at verse 31. What God has done now. And when they had prayed. The place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. The fullness of the Spirit gives us boldness yes. to preach Hallelujah. the Word. Now notice what didn't happen here. They didn't speak with tongues. <laughs> you know why? Because the tongue was only a sign gift of four different times. When the gospel was presented to the Jews, to Israel, and the Spirit came that day on the day of Pentecost, the gift of tongues was there as evidence, evidence that the Holy Spirit had came and they had been filled with the Spirit. When the gospel was taken to the Samaritans, another group of people, and they received Christ, the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them the evidence speaking in tongues to show that they had the same thing the Jews had. The gospel taken to the Gentiles and when they received Cornelius' household as Gentiles received the message, received Christ and was filled with the Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues to reveal that, to reveal that this is consistent this is all, every person that receives Christ is a part of the church alike. And then, when the gospel was taken to those of John's disciples that had not had any understanding of the Holy Spirit because they were baptized under John the Baptist preaching, and now when they received Christ and the Holy Spirit, the evidence of tongues. Those four times. And what God was doing, and He was showing that everybody, regardless whether they're Jew, Gentile, Samaritan, whoever they are, when they believe on Jesus Christ, they become a part of His church exactly the same. There is no difference. And now, what do we see? Here's another group of people that have become believers, but they are Jews. They're part of the uh, Jewish nation. And now we have the feeling of the Holy Spirit, but we don't have the evidence of tongues because it's already happened to them. They understand what it's about. Now they speak the Word of God with boldness. The boldness to preach the gospel is the evidence of the Spirit, the evidence of the Holy Spirit. Now we know that there will be different times that they will be filled with the Spirit because the filling of the Spirit is not one time. We are baptized with the Spirit into the family of God and we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. But there are different times when we are filled with the Spirit. And when we are filled with the Spirit, Paul talks about in Ephesians 5, we are to be that way and live that way. It's a command. But that happens when we 
yield ourselves totally and completely to the Holy Spirit. And he has full control of us. And when that happens, we will be able to speak the word of God with boldness. Regardless of wherever you are, whatever group you're with, whatever the persecution is or however they're acting toward you, when you are filled with the Spirit, you will have the boldness to stand in any situation, in any group, and speak with boldness and authority yes. the message of Jesus Christ. Oh. That's what's the difference in what we have and what this world has. We don't cower to the persecution or to the opposition. We stand bold and we proclaim, thus saith the Lord. Well, I trust today that God has spoken to your heart and next time we'll look at how the church is acting toward the other believers. Let's stand for prayer. Our Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have given us this time together. You have brought us to the close of another service. And Lord, your word is still here. Your word will work wherever it goes. It will not return void. And Lord, the Holy Spirit in us will empower us and give us the boldness to preach it. Lord, I thank you that we can claim that today. I pray now as we leave here that we will go and we will be faithful to whatever you would ask us. That you may get glory through us and our lives will be lived 